Um, very good. Uh, let us continue with EFT plus renormalization group. In the last lecture, I gave you a paradigmatic example where we take, took QED with an electron and the muon and integrated out the muon to obtain an effective low energy theory. Uh, okay. um, and uh, this uh, EFT contained only the photon and the electron and differed from the fundamental theory by the electric charge or by the fine structure constant alpha. And um, let me just remind you once again, uh, the main outcome of the analysis is that if you have such a case where you have a fundamental theory with two different energy scales, a heavy scale and a light scale, and you are interested in the physics at one of those two scales, in our case the light scale, then inevitably in a fixed order calculation, large logarithms will appear. Large logarithms of this large mass ratio will appear. And um, it can be sufficient to take into account these logs at some fixed order, but sometimes it is necessary to take into account the logarithms at higher orders and uh, as it is called, resum them. In other words, take into account all terms of the form n loop times logarithm to the n or n loop times log to the n minus one. We know that such terms exist and uh, they can be resumed and taken into account automatically by using renormalization group techniques. And we have went through the appropriate example. And today we will just uh, do um, a few more examples of this kind to illustrate the technique and also for me to show you uh, what kind of range of applications actually exists in um, particle physics such that you have some overview. So QED with muons was one issue and there uh, the fine structure constant changed by a constant shift and now let us look at the analog in quantum chromodynamics in QCD. So let us look to, at QCD with heavy quarks. And we will look at this without uh, focusing on too many calculational details, but just illustrate the main points. So, first of all, this is extremely similar to the previous case, but it is even more important. because higher order corrections in QCD are larger than in QED and therefore having control over large logarithms at not only one loop but maybe at all orders is also more relevant than in QCD. So let us consider the case of strong interactions at energies between, let's say, a few GeV, like maybe three GeV, up to, um, for example, one TeV, uh, in other words, up to energies at the Large Hadron Collider, then you see that uh, in between these energy scales, so three GeV is quite low, but not quite as low as that you need to consider pions, kaons, or protons, but a little bit higher energy such that perturbative QCD is maybe just about usable. But then in this energy range, there are two mass scales, namely there is the bottom mass, uh, which is approximately 4 GeV, depending on how you actually define what the bottom mass is. Depending on the definition, you get different values, but they are approximately 4 GeV, and the top mass is approximately 172 GeV. So th there is a large separation of quark mass scales, and then there are also um, large separations maybe to the energy of the process that you consider. So we have this typical situation when we look at a diagram with different energies, then we have very high energy scales, maybe LHC energy scales. Then here we have the energy scale of the top quark mass. Here we have the energy scale of the bottom quark mass. And suppose you want to do precise predictions of QCD at all those different energies. Then uh, clearly um, at a very high energy scale, you need to take into account everything. Here you have the full theory. So here the relevant theory is QCD 
6, where QCD6 means QCD with all the six quark flavors that we know. And uh, this is an appropriate description. But below the top quark mass, we know that if we would use this QCD with uh, all quarks, the same thing would happen as with the muon. Namely, here we get um, logarithms of the ratio of the top mass divided by the energy scale of the process. And these logarithms spoil the convergence of perturbation theory. Therefore, it is advantageous to go into an EFT, uh, which contains only light particles. In other words, which does not contain any more the top quark. And in this effective field theory, we can then um, use renormalization group running to go to any of those uh, light energy scales in order to eliminate the large logarithms out of our calculation. So the correct effective field theory is QCD5 without the top quark. And uh, then, what is necessary is to relate the two theories, QCD with six flavors and QCD with five flavors. And the relationship will uh, be done by a matching calculation similar to QED. And the matching calculation would give us as an output uh, that the fine structure constant of QCD will differ in the two theories. And the difference is calculable. Um, and uh, the difference uh, comes from matching corrections which contain no large logarithms. So let us uh, simply write this down. So uh, this theory neglects effects of order energy divided by the top mass to um, some powers, but it describes logarithms of uh, this ratio and in order to uh, use this kind of idea, what are the technical ingredients is, first of all, a matching. And uh, in the literature on QCD, this is often called decoupling coefficient. So, and uh, it affects the strong gauge coupling, alpha S. So there is an alpha S5 for the five flavor QCD, which depends on the renormalization scale mu, which is given, this is sometimes written with a decoupling coefficient zeta, um, S of mu times alpha S in the six flavor QCD, also as a function of the renormalization scale mu. And uh, so uh, this relationship is uh, of the identical form as the one we have derived for alpha in QED with a muon. Uh, we didn't call it zeta, but we had an explicit relationship which contained the vacuum polarization of the photon coming from the muon loop. And uh, so that is basically the same here. And uh, we just write down what happens if you do the calculation and put in uh, mu equal to m top then what you get is zeta s of mu is equal to one at three level plus terms of order alpha s times logarithm of mu divided by m top plus order alpha s square for two loop. And if we put the uh, scale equal to the top mass, then the one loop term vanishes. So that is kind of an artificial accident, and exactly the same thing happened in QED in our calculation. We saw it that the vacuum polarization is exactly proportional to the log, and the log vanishes if we put the scales equal. And in QCD, the same is true. But uh, first of all, this is not guaranteed to happen in all matching calculations. In general, there are non-logarithmic um, terms as well. And at the two-loop level, um, even if you set the scales equal, there is a non-vanishing two-loop effect. And that is what you should generally expect. But so in this way, you can relate the fine structure constants between the two theories. And then in the low energy theory, 
you can use the renormalization group equation. So you use renormalization group running in this QCD5. That means you put uh, the number of quark flavors equal to 5 in the beta function of QCD. So the QCD beta function contains variables, the number of colors and the number of flavors. And uh, then you put the number of flavors to 5 and you get the appropriate beta function for the running in this energy regime. And then if you use this beta function according to our analysis, it will correctly take into account all higher powers of these logarithms. And that is the advantage of this calculation. So the combination of these two steps allows the most accurate predictions uh, of QCD at all these different energy scales. And this means that you can now um, use it in different ways. You can use it, for example, in one direction. If you take as an input, for example, the experimental measurement at low energies. Let's say you do a measurement at 10 to 50 GeV and you measure strongly interacting processes, then you get a measurement of the coupling alpha 5 at some low energy scales. But then uh, using uh, these various steps, you can extrapolate to all energies and do predictions of QCD for high energy processes, for example. And then these predictions will be as precise as possible. Output could then be theory predictions at high energies. But you could just as well do the opposite. If you happen to have a high energy measurement, for example, from the Large Hadron Collider, then uh, you could infer from this as a measurement outcome the value alpha 6 at some very high mu. Then you can uh, extrapolate down to low energies and do a prediction at low energies uh, for from QCD. But uh, basically it allows you to correlate, this is the general statement, it allows you to correlate observables as precisely as possible um, if they are defined at all different energy scales. So this is what you can do with this technique of um, matching EFTs and running in EFTs, you get precise predictions at all energy scales. And uh, always here, terms which are power suppressed by uh, energy ratios, they are neglected. And they cannot be taken into account in the current approach because we do not have higher dimensional operators in our effective field theory. We neglect systematically all these terms by having only dimension four operators in the Lagrangian. So if you know phenomenologically that uh, such terms would be relevant for your calculation, then the approach fails and you need to do a different approach. All right, so much for QCD. Any questions? I repeat, it is analogous and the calculations are basically identical to the ones in QED. Let's look at another example application, which is well known and famous, Grand Unified Series. We did this already in the exercise. Um, and let me again just sketch it. This will not be an introduction to Grand Unified Series, but uh, it will just be an illustration how they use this te same technique. So here we start from an assumption that we have a fundamental theory which is a grand unified theory, and uh, that could be, for example, based on a gauge group SU5 or SO10. These are particularly interesting gauge groups for various reasons, which we could discuss in a lecture on guts. 
and uh, the main point is that these gauge groups allow only one single gauge coupling. Alpha gut. These groups are what we call simple. That means that uh, essentially you can reach any um, uh, group element from um, any other one by a group transformation. And um, uh, all commutators are non-vanishing and that is why there can only be a single uh, gut gauge coupling. And in the theory, there are then many new, in other words, non-standard model gauge bosons and also Higgs bosons. As you may know, in any gauge theory, there are as many gauge bosons as there are generators of the group. And um, so uh, SU3, for example, has eight generators, the Gelman matrices. SU2 has three generators, the Pauli matrices. And SU5 has 24 generators. Therefore, in SU5, there are 24 gauge bosons. But in the standard model overall, we have 12 gauge bosons. Therefore, there are 12 additional gauge bosons in SU5. And uh, the Higgs bosons and their vacuum expectation values are necessary to break the symmetry spontaneously to make some gauge bosons heavy. And uh, therefore, you need a Higgs sector in the gut theory, which makes 12 gauge bosons super heavy, such that their masses are of the order of the gut mass. And uh, so these are not the Higgs bosons of the standard model because the vacuum expectation value of our Higgs is 200 GeV. That is not sufficient to generate masses of the order 10 to the 16 GeV. There need to be some other additional Higgses with a vacuum expectation value of the order 10 to the 16 GeV, such that 12 out, out of the 24 gauge bosons have masses of this very high order. And uh, figuring out what kind of Higgses you need and what kind of Mexican head potential you need is the task of uh, gut model building, if you want. So, uh, but that is not our business right now. And in SU5 uh, or SO10, what about the fermions in the standard model? There are quarks and leptons, and these are the only fermions which there are. And the nice thing about these two gauge groups is that uh, there are no additional fermions compared to the standard model. So exactly all the fermions that we know fit into multiplets of SU5 and SO10, which is really uh, the essential point why these groups are so interesting. There are no new fermions except right-handed neutrinos. But that is not really necessarily new. Okay, so then clearly uh, below the gut scale, uh, the, you need an effective field theory. And uh, in the simplest case, the effective field theory contains only the standard model particles and the standard model symmetries. So the effective field theory, which is valid below the gut scale, is just the standard model itself. That is not necessarily true. There are supersymmetric guts where the correct low energy EFT is the supersymmetric extension of the standard model or something even more complicated than that. But let's stick to the standard model. In the standard model, we then have three gauge couplings, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. And uh, as we already discussed in the exercise, it is useful to use a gut normalization for the gauge couplings, such that the trace over all fermions of the generators TA, TB for uh, all gauge um, boson indices, and uh, you always sum over all fermions of the theory, has always the same prefactor times Kronecker delta AB. That is not the case in the standard model if you uh, formulate it in the usual way, because in the standard model, if you do this trace for QCD, 
You have here QCD generators and you sum over all strongly interacting fermions, you get Kronecker delta times one coefficient. If you do here SU2 generators and you sum over all weakly interacting doublets, then you get the same constant times Kronecker delta AB, which is nice. But if you do this for hypercharge and you sum here over all hypercharges of all fermions and here you put hypercharge square, you get uh, Kronecker delta times another constant. And in order to compare with a gut, where of course you would always have the same prefactor here, you should redefine what you mean by hypercharge simply by a factor that is trivial because everywhere there always appears the product gauge coupling times hypercharge value. So you just redefine the gauge coupling and by one factor and the hypercharge value by the opposite factor, so the product remains the same. But then you can adjust this coefficient here to be uniform overall gauge bosons. And in order to do that, uh, we need to say alpha one is equal to the usual alpha hypercharge, alpha y times five over three. All right, and then the diagram looks like this. Here you have energy, and uh, then you have here a very high grand unification scale, m got, and a very low electroweak scale defined by the set mass and the top mass or the Higgs vacuum expectation value. So here you have the fundamental grand unified theory. Here you have an EFT, which is the standard model. And uh, here you want to do low energy experiments or theory predictions, which can then be compared with experiments. And if you want to uh, test whether grand unification is a correct idea, then what you need to do is, of course, you start from the assumption that the grand unification theory is correct and you must do predictions within that grand unified theory and compare those predictions to experiment. And now those predictions cannot be computed directly from within the grand unified theory because that calculation will involve inevitably huge logarithms of the large ratio between the gut scale and the weak scale. And those logarithms uh, spoil the convergence of perturbation theory. Therefore, um, it's not good to do calculations in the fundamental theory, but we need to use the EFT approach. That means we go to the gut scale, and at this scale, we do a matching between the fundamental theory and the standard model as an EFT, and uh, then do a renormalization group running within the standard model. And uh, then we have here at the low scale a prediction which is the correct prediction from the grand unified theory, and we can compare those predictions to the experiment. And so let me just sketch what you need to do. So here you need to do a matching, and this matching, among other things, will give you values for the standard model effective gauge couplings, alpha i, at the scale mu, will then be computed as alpha gut at mu, plus higher order corrections. And it is clear that there are higher order corrections because we have seen the same already for QED if we integrate out the muon. So similarly, of course, there will be higher order corrections. At three level, uh, there is just equality of the couplings, unification of couplings. But if you take into account higher orders in the matching, very clearly there will be higher order corrections similar to here this zeta s or the vacuum polarization of the muon in QED. And these higher order corrections can be calculated and they will depend on the details of the grand unified theory. So this will be one place where the details of your gut assumption play a role. Then you use RGE running in the standard model. And uh, that basically resums or takes into account all logs of the form m gut over mz. So 
if you use one loop beta functions, you take into account all the n loop terms of log to the n. If you use two loop beta functions, you take into account n loop times log to the n minus one, and so on. And then finally, uh, you are at the low scale and you can compute processes within the standard model using the running couplings alpha i in the standard model at the weak energy scale alpha i at mz. So, and uh, again, the only place where the gut details enter are the value of the gut scale and uh, the one loop matching corrections um, from the matching. Everything else is calculated within the standard model. So if you trace um, all the different steps, then we can just again make sure that you understand that at you, there are three calculational steps, matching, running, and computation in the low energy EFT. And at all the three steps, there are no large logarithms in the calculation. So here, if you do that calculation and you put mu equal to the gut scale, then the loop diagrams will involve uh, only mu and gut scale masses. So there are no large logarithms in this calculation, neither at three level, nor one loop, nor higher orders. No large logs uh, anywhere. So here, in the beta function running, uh, the logs are resummed uh, as according to our analysis with the table. And at the low scale, then you do calculations at the weak scale in terms of alpha at the weak scale and mu is at the weak scale. So therefore, again, here there are no large logarithms. Therefore, at all places, no large logs can occur and therefore you have full control over uh, the large logarithms. And uh, depending on the loop order that you use at all the different steps, you know exactly which kind of terms you have taken into account in this way. No, we are not looks in the calculations. So uh, the moral of the story is that you get in this way precise predictions of low energy physics starting from a grand unified theory assumption. And therefore, this allows, of course, tests of grand unification. And what can be such tests? So here is a diagram as a function of ln mu square and the coupling constants, uh, one over alpha i. Then. Um, somewhere here there is the gut scale and then in the gut theory we know that there is just one single gauge coupling alpha gut and this alpha gut is typically asymptotically free so one over alpha goes to infinity so this is alpha gut then here there is uh, the matching scale and uh, Significantly below the matching scale, the standard model theory is a precise approximation. And then we are the matching. You have the three coupling constants in the standard model. So here, the lowest one is alpha three for strong interactions. The middle one is alpha two for SU2 and alpha one for hypercharge. And then here at the low scale, say mz, uh, you can measure the values of the gauge coupling and compare to the prediction of grand unification and then check whether the prediction agrees with experiment or not. And the outcome of this is that for the minimal versions of grand unification, uh, the non-supersymmetric guts do not agree with the experiment because even though uh, the predictions are not far off the measurements, they are significantly uh, enough away to say that uh, these non-SUSI minimal guts 
are excluded experimentally by the measurements of the gauge couplings. However, supersymmetric gauge couplings can fit the data because the running of the beta functions is just a little bit uh, modified and therefore um, with the modified running, the couplings agree with the experiment. A second uh, thing that is noteworthy is, okay, once the couplings agree, um, uh, and you can get the appropriate unification, you can, of course, as a byproduct, um, analyze what is the necessary gut scale, what is the mass scale where the matching must happen. And the outcome of that in, for example, SUSI guts is M gut is approximately 10 to the 16 GeV. And then a firm prediction of grand unified theories, let me just squeeze this here somewhere, is proton decay. The proton uh, must be unstable in grand unified theories because quarks and leptons are unified. Therefore, there is no conservation of baryon and lepton number individually. So baryons can turn into leptons by the emission of gut gauge bosons, since they are just part of the same multiplet. So automatically, some gut gauge bosons have quantum numbers which exchange baryons into leptons. The proton, therefore, is always unstable, but the proton decay is mediated by these gut gauge bosons, so it is suppressed by Feynman diagrams where you have a propagator with 1 over 10 to the 16 GeV square. And therefore, the lifetime of gamma proton will be proportional to 1 over the gut scale to the fourth power. In the simplest cases, and if the gut scale is 10 to the 16 GeV, you can calculate how many years is the lifetime of a proton, uh, roughly. And that is just about in agreement with measurements because uh, we have not seen proton decay so far and that puts a lower limit on the lifetime of the proton. The lower limit, I don't recall the exact number, something like 10 to the 32 or 10 to the 34 years, so extremely large number of years. Um, but uh, that is kind of in agreement. But it's just about in agreement. It's not in agreement by a large um, gap. Therefore, it really depends on the precise details whether gut theories are viable. It depends finally on the exact value of the gut scale and finally on the details how exactly is proton decay um, predicted in terms of the various gut gauge bosons, maybe gut Higgs bosons and so on, in order to um, check the viability of guts. So let's just say this can be viable. Okay. Then let us look at the final example for which we could also show some transparencies later on. Uh, and the final example is uh, the Higgs boson mass. In SUSI models. So uh, yesterday we had exercise and there I already gave uh, quite a few remarks on supersymmetry and let's just repeat a, a subset of them. Let me focus on the serious uh, points. Uh, not repeat that supersymmetry is the greatest invention since the wheel. But uh, let's just say supersymmetry stipulates uh, symmetry between fermions and bosons. And uh, we have a prediction that the Hamiltonian is given essentially by the sum of squares of SUSI operators. So there exists supersymmetric operators, QI, there are several of them. They form a representation of the Poincaré algebra. But uh, if you add all squares of this, uh, of this kind, then you get the Hamiltonian. 
So basically, um, supersymmetry is for quantum field theory what are complex numbers for mathematics. Everything improves, the properties of theories improve dramatically, and um, not only do you have improved behavior, but you also have extremely far-reaching and deep statements like exact solutions or exact theorems on properties of quantum field theories, just following from the extended symmetry. And um, in a way, uh, as we discussed yesterday, relativistic quantum field theory as a matter of principle can contain states with uh, angular momenta, which are either integer or half integer. But within the Poincaré algebra, you cannot change the angular momentum by half units, even though the half units exist. You can only change them by integer units. Similarly, relativistic quantum field theories allow the existence of fermions and bosons, but they just form an independent life on their own and cannot be uh, connected. And supersymmetry, in that sense, completes the Poincaré symmetry because now we have these additional operators which become part of the extended Poincaré algebra, which exchange fermions into bosons and which change angular momenta by half integer units. So it is really a completion, a natural completion of Poincaré symmetry, and in this sense it is obviously an extremely rich and deep, fascinating and important subject for quantum field theory. And it has been discussed a lot also as a phenomenological, um, alternative to the standard model because it can be that supersymmetry is realized in nature with the existence of supersymmetric partner particles to the standard model particles. And then we get a model, the minimal supersymmetric standard model, which is the simplest implementation of the idea of supersymmetry in particle physics. So that model is the standard model. Um, plus all supersymmetric partners uh, which are necessary to generate a supersymmetric spectrum. And let me just write down what the particles are that exist in this minimal supersymmetric standard model. You have the standard model gauge bosons, and they have exactly the same properties as in the standard model. You have the standard model quarks and leptons. They also have the same properties as in the standard model. You have Higgs bosons, but they are different compared to the standard model, namely you have two Higgs doublets, which are called HU and HD. In the standard model, you have only one of them, but uh, you need two, and uh, the index um, symbolizes uh, their uh, role. Namely, the HU doublet gives masses to all the uptype fermions via its vacuum expectation value, so you get vacuum expectation values VU, VD, and they give masses to uptype or downtype fermions. And then to all of these particles, there are supersymmetric partners with the opposite spin. So spin one or spin zero get spin one half partners, spin one half partners um, uh, get spin zero partners. Then what are the parameters of the supersymmetric model? There are first of all supersymmetric parameters, so in other words, uh, parameters corresponding to the theory as long as exact supersymmetry is valid. In this approximation, you have fewer parameters than in the standard model because you have a higher degree of symmetry. So the parameters on the SUSY level are the standard model gauge couplings, the standard model Yukawa couplings. They have the same structure, but they have maybe different values, so just to be sure, they have different values. And maybe to have a notation, I thought here, let's say the standard model parameters, GI standard model, let us abbreviate them by GI hat, and the uh, corresponding MSSM versions, let's simply call them 
GI without hat. And then the values of these may be different. And it would be a calculation to figure out how different they are. So standard model gauge couplings and you cover couplings exist also in the SUSI model. And then the standard model has how many additional parameters which are neither gauge couplings nor you cover couplings? Some knowledge of the standard model, please. but they would be a function of the Yukawa couplings. So the masses come from the Yukawa couplings and then of course the ratios are also fixed. The Higgs parameters? How many Higgs parameters are there? Two. Which ones? Mu and lambda. Correct. So these are the uh, two additional parameters. And now the mu square mass parameter in the Higgs potential, uh, that doesn't arise on the SUSI level. But the quartic Higgs coupling lambda is not a free parameter in the SUSI model, but it is predicted. And that is the essential difference between supersymmetry and non-supersymmetric theories, that the quartic uh, self-couplings between scalars are never free parameters, and specifically not here. So let's write down what it is. So the quartic Higgs coupling. And let me also call it lambda hat. The hat denotes a standard model parameter. Lambda hat is equal to approximately uh, some combination of the gauge couplings, GW square plus GY square divided by four. And this applies uh, if the value tan beta which is this ratio between the two vacuum expectation values is much bigger than one. So then you have such a quartic Higgs coupling, which is given in this way. Uh, now, um, in addition to these parameters here, which um, come from the supersymmetric sector of the uh, model, there are parameters responsible for SUSI breaking because in nature we do not observe an exactly supersymmetric spectrum um, which would require that the masses of standard model and SUSI particles were the same. Uh, we see that they are not the same. By the way, supersymmetry also predicts that the interactions are the same between masses. So if we would have a super partner to an electron which has the same interactions and the same mass, but a different spin that is impossible to um, overlook in experiment because it's guaranteed that we can produce um, pairs like E plus E minus with spin um, zero instead of spin one half with the same probability at colliders and we have not seen this. So therefore that is excluded. So we need uh, supersymmetry breaking. And we do this with so-called soft supersymmetry breaking by dimension two or three terms in the Lagrangian. And let me simply say in this way the following happens, namely all the supersymmetric partner particles are heavier than the standard model particles by some amount which depends on the supersymmetry breaking. And here for this analysis that we do today, we simply assume that they are all of the same order of magnitude M Susi. So we now assume that there is one mass scale M Susi and all the masses of all Susi particles are approximately equal to the single mass scale. That is of course a simplification, but that is what we assume today. Then um, there are uh, also some additional um, Susi breaking parameters corresponding to dimension three terms in the Lagrangian. Uh, which do not directly give masses, but which are nevertheless uh, SUSI breaking. 
certain trilinear couplings. For example, and the most important ones are such couplings here between a Higgs boson and superpartners of the top quark, the so-called stop particles, SUSY top, and there are two versions, stop left and stop right partners, and uh, the vertex factor here, this is a trilinear scalar interaction, so the operator has dimension three, three scalar fields give dimension three, so the parameter has dimension one, the parameter has a unit of mass. And so, um, let us write this parameter here, how should we write it today, as small xt times m susi times um, sorry, let me increase this, um, xt times yt times m susi, where y top is the top Yukawa coupling, as in the standard model, and xt is a new dimensionless quantity in uh, the MSSM, and m susi is the mass scale of all the susi partners. So we have a dimension one parameter, and therefore, without loss of generality, we can parameterize it by m susi times a dimensionless number, which we call xt. And then this implies that we expect that the value of the vertex is of the order of the SUSI mass scale. All right, that is the setup, and now the question is, what is the prediction of the model for the Higgs boson mass that we have observed at the Large Hadron Collider? The measurement value of the Higgs mass is 125 GeV, and here you see what we already stressed a lot yesterday in the exercise, but you see it here slowly emerging, there will be a prediction of supersymmetry for the value of the Higgs boson mass because the quartic Higgs self-interaction is not a free parameter. And the quartic Higgs self-interaction is the one which gives rise to the value of the Higgs mass. Since it's not free, the Higgs mass is not free. So we can calculate the SUSI prediction for the Higgs mass and then ask whether it is actually compatible with the measurement value. And that calculation needs to be done rather precisely, because if you do it imprecisely, you will not get agreement with the measurement value. So, this is now our task. Compute the Higgs boson mass in the MSSM. And of course, we use the EFT plus renormalization group approach. So, and let me sketch again the basic idea. The basic idea is again here an energy scale diagram. We have here the SUSI scale. And at this scale, that is the mass of all the uh, SUSI partner particles. And above that scale, we are above the energy where we can excite all particles of the MSSM. So here, the full MSSM is a valid description of uh, physics at this energy scale. Below the SUSI scale, we should uh, at best integrate out all the SUSI particles in order to have an EFT with only light scales, such that we can use renormalization group arguments. So here we use the EFT, and the EFT is the theory without all the SUSI partner particles, and therefore it is the standard model in the simplest case. Then we use renormalization group running in the standard model to go to the weak scale, which is the scale of the W mass, the Z mass, the Higgs mass, and also the top mass, which is important. And at this scale, we compute the Higgs mass. So our three steps that we need to do in the calculation is again matching between the MSSM and the standard model. That will give us 
coupling constants of the standard model as a function of the fundamental couplings in the MSSM. Then we use running in the standard model. And finally, we calculate in the standard model the Higgs mass. And the details of the supersymmetric theory enter in the matching process uh, at this scale. Everything else is independent of SUSI details, but the details that enter here are obviously important. And then we can correlate um, the Higgs mass prediction with other observables, and uh, we can do the, arrange the prediction as a function of different sets of input parameters. You know, a prediction is always a relationship between an output and some input, and we can choose as an input the fundamental MSSM parameters, calculate Higgs mass as a function of fundamental parameters, but they are unknown. So what can we do with the prediction? Or we can eliminate those fundamental parameters in favor of other observables at a low scale. Then we can predict the Higgs mass as a function of other observables that have already been measured. So that then basically we would need to go from here down to two different observables, correlate them, and then we have a prediction of the Higgs mass as a function of, for example, the Z boson mass. So uh, this is kind of the outline that we need to do. And um, let us do it in a few stages, such that you get some experience, hopefully. And I would like to begin simply by doing the very, very lowest order prediction, which is not good enough, but uh, let us nevertheless walk through this lowest order prediction as well. So at very lowest order, you go through the three steps, but each time you do um, no higher order corrections. So the first step is matching. Matching means that we are at the SUSI scale and we require that the standard model agrees with the MSSM for processes at this scale. And then it means in this case that we get a prediction for the quartic Higgs coupling in terms of gauge couplings. That is our matching calculation that will be the outcome. So we simply get lambda hat. Uh, hat means the standard model lambda is approximately equal to the gauge coupling GW square plus GY square divided by four. And here you see I can express a standard model parameter as a function of SUSI parameters, but I would also have to do another matching. What is the value of uh, the standard model gauge couplings GW and GY? So there would be another matching condition for this, similar to what we have done in QCD and QED for the muon. And here the matching at lowest order simply tells us the gauge couplings are the same. So gauge coupling in the MSSM and gauge coupling in the standard model are the same at lowest order, like in QED when we integrated out the muon. And then of course you can put here GW in the standard model or GW in the MSSM and that would be identical. Then we do the second step, which is the running. Running comes from beta functions. The beta functions exist at the loop level. So at lowest order uh, tree level, the beta functions are zero. So let's simply neglect the running. Which corresponds to a zeroth order in the beta functions. And then it means, uh, by the way, here this was at the scale mu equal to the SUSI scale, and here then we get lambda hat at the weak scale. Let's say maybe m top is equal to lambda hat at the SUSI scale. So very simple relationship because of three level running, so neglected running. Everything is scale independent in this approximation. All right, then the third step is that we calculate the Higgs mass in the standard model from the input parameters that we have obtained in the MS mass scheme. So the Higgs mass uh, at lowest order is the three level Higgs mass. So we need to know the three level Higgs mass if we know lambda. So compute M Higgs 
in the standard model at tree level. So the result is then m x square is equal to 2 times lambda hat times v square in some normalization where uh, I use here this uh, Higgs doublet is given by charged goldstone times uh, v plus 1 over square root of 2 times Higgs plus i times neutral goldstone. So just to clarify, there are two different conventions for v in uh, around and uh, here we use this one, which is a little bit conventional in this field. I'm not saying that this is the better convention and I wouldn't use it elsewhere, but uh, here uh, the literature tends to use it. And then we have this prediction for the Higgs mass and uh, now we can combine the three steps. So uh, at the matching scale, we know lambda is given by gauge couplings. Lambda doesn't run and without saying it, the gauge couplings of course also don't run. Uh, and then we have the Higgs mass expressed in this way. So if we plug in lambda, then we get the Higgs mass is given by gauge coupling square uh, times V square divided by two, and that is nothing but a Z boson mass. So we get the prediction M Higgs square is equal to the Z mass square. This is the lowest order prediction of the MSSM for the Higgs mass in the approximation that I made here. So, you know, I didn't spell out exactly what assumptions go into that statement. Uh, that statement gets corrections and they are important uh, if you look at the details, but ignoring this, we have this firm prediction. The Higgs mass is equal to the Z mass at lowest order perturbation theory. And that is of course a striking prediction, really interesting prediction because first of all, the Higgs mass is not a free parameter. This is uh, clearly shown by this uh, nice statement, uh, which shows the power of supersymmetry in predicting additional things that cannot be predicted in non-supersymmetric theories. And the prediction is um, at the weak scale, so it automatically follows that the Higgs mass is not uh, Planck scale mass or Gut scale mass or TeV scale, but it is at the weak scale. Uh, but the prediction doesn't agree with experiment. So if you look at the details, then the order of magnitude may be right, but uh, the exact value of course is wrong because the Higgs is heavier than the Z. So let me just uh, write here this remark. This is the lowest order prediction for 10 beta going to infinity and M Susi going to infinity. And uh, just for Susi experts among you, uh, we require here that the mass of the additional Higgs bosons which uh, exist in the MSSM, they are as heavy as the Susi particles. So MA, this additional Higgs mass, is of the order of M Susi, so it also is very large. And in that case, we get this firm prediction. Now, uh, let us improve it by doing higher orders everywhere. Okay. And we can do it still in stages. So let us first look at the logarithmic improvement. So let's do a logarithmic improvement. That is the simplest thing that you can do. So um, when you are afraid of doing loop calculations, then um, going higher here would involve a loop calculation. Doing higher order here involves a loop calculation, but higher order here only involves looking up beta functions from the literature or computing beta functions yourself. So that is much easier and also extremely powerful. So let's do some logarithmic improvement where the step one and step three are unchanged. But step two becomes now the following. So we use um, here in the running, we use one loop running. Uh, and for this we use the one loop beta functions. So uh, the most important parameter is the lambda parameter. So we need the beta function of lambda in the standard model. 
turns out the beta function of lambda in the standard model, as we discussed in the exercise, is minus 12 kappa L times uh, y top to the fourth power. So y top hat means standard model value of the top core Q-Kawa coupling. And I always take only the very, very leading terms. So all the beta functions are more complicated than what I write. So let's say approximate. But now in order to calculate the running of lambda, you somehow need the running of the top Yukawa, unfortunately. So we also need what is the beta function of the top Yukawa in the standard model. Uh, turns out to be the following, minus eight kappa L times Y top times G3 square. All right. Um, turns out that the beta function for Y needs the uh, running of G3 which is the strong gauge coupling. Therefore, we also need the beta function for G3 in the standard model, which turns out to be minus seven kappa L times G3 to the third power. And kappa L is of course one over 16 pi square, a loop factor. Okay, and uh, this is what we solved in the exercise. We integrated all three beta functions and obtained an analytic expression for the resulting lambda, which comes out of the running between the two scales. So let me write down the result. So we get lambda hat at some scale m top is equal to lambda hat at the scale m susi plus an additive term, namely plus 12 times, um, sorry, that is wrong, uh, 12 times y, oh, sorry, no, I, uh, did I make a mistake? I think, yeah. So I think that, uh, sorry, I think that should be six instead of 12, what I had on my sheet here. Uh, so six times y top to the fourth power. y top hat to the fourth power at the scale m top. Times the following. Ts times kappa l minus 16 uh, g3 square at m top with hat times ts square times kappa l square plus higher orders, where ts is the logarithm of m susi divided by m top. And the important thing of that formula is that all terms of the order ts to the power n times kappa l to the power n are correct. This is an example where we resum in that language the logarithms at all loop orders, namely the leading logarithms. So all the terms of n loop order times logarithm to the nth power, they are correct. They come out all correctly, and we have not only a power series, but we had an analytical one-line result, which is a, a complicated formula, but in one line, we have the exact result containing all these n-loop terms with log to the nth power. And if we expand this one-line formula in a power series, we get here at the lowest order one logarithm at the one loop order, uh, sorry, uh, so this is one loop at the two loop order, we get an additional factor g3 square and log to the second power. Here would have g3 to the fourth power times log to the third power and so on. So we have all these terms and we have in such a relationship between the lambda at the high scale and lambda at the low scale. And according to this, you see that uh, what is the sign? Lambda at the low scale, is it higher or lower than lambda at the high scale? So what is the sign of the square bracket? The sign is positive because uh, Ts at the one loop level is positive. And one loop is of course dominant. 
and uh, so uh, the low scale lambda is larger than the high scale lambda. So by the running, the Higgs mass prediction will increase and we get closer to the experimental value. So running increases MH and we get the prediction. Let me write the prediction here into this box. M hex square is equal to MZ square plus 12 times V square times lambda hat to the fourth power at the scale M top times TS kappa L plus all the higher order terms uh, coming from the square bracket. And just as a discussion, so the product of these two factors here, V squared times Y top, Y top times V uh, is just the top mass, so here we get M top square times another YT square. M top square is very large, so essentially you get MZ square plus 12 times M top square. Okay, T times kappa L, which is 1 over 16 pi square. But uh, M top square is even larger than MZ, and the prefactors 12 divided by 16 pi square are not so small. Therefore, you indeed get a huge enhancement of the Higgs mass. Uh, which is, um, if you think of other predictions in quantum field theory, interesting because it is an additive prediction. Uh, very often, higher order corrections are somehow proportional to tree level. So you would get uh, expression of the kind one loop is three level times one plus uh, order alpha corrections. And then whenever three level is small, uh, the order alpha corrections are also small. Here, however, you have an expression of the form three level plus one loop, and the one loop is not at all proportional to three level. It is actually totally uncorrelated. It could very well happen that the set mass is maybe close to zero, maybe because the electroweak gauge couplings here are approximately zero, but the top mass remains whatever it is. Then it could easily happen that the tree level is much smaller than the one loop correction. In reality, tree level and one loop are approximately of the same order of magnitude, so we can get here almost order 100% corrections, but it does not mean that perturbation theory doesn't converge. It rather means that at the loop level, we get new effects which are not proportional to tree level because new parameters enter the prediction which don't appear at the lowest order. And so this is something that can happen in theories where you have a lot of different parameters. Okay, uh, so this is large. And on the other hand, let's state again here, all leading blocks are correct. So this is this statement here. So you have a prediction which is correct at three level and at all n loop orders um, in terms of the log to the n terms. Very powerful method. So and this analysis was done historically at the beginning of the 1990s where there were experiments searching for the Higgs boson and people were wondering whether the SUSY prediction that the Higgs mass is correlated to the Z mass could survive experimental scrutiny and before uh, the experiment was really uh, done um, they came up with this logarithmic improvement and higher order corrections to the Higgs mass and obtained the result that the Higgs could actually be much heavier than MZ in supersymmetric theories. I think there was a question. Oh, uh, okay, uh, not really. Okay, internally there may be a reason, but let's not go into this detail. 
Let us rather continue to improve the prediction. Now we have done uh, step one and step three at three level, but step two at uh, one loop level, and this gives us uh, three level correct and all n loop log to the n terms correct. Now let's improve further. The next step is to improve the non-logarithmic parts. By the way, uh, do you still see where the details of supersymmetry enter the prediction? Here, where do the details enter? Because all of this comes from the beta functions of the standard model. Here we have integrated the standard model beta functions, but where can you pinpoint um, the details of how SUSE is realized? How would the SUSE detail enter there? Uh, due to uh, matching. The matching, okay, yes, indeed, that's right. But uh, three-level matching in this case simply means that this is essentially equal. So no particularly big deal, but there are some other places. So we have the mass of the SUSE in the in T? Yes, so here the SUSE mass enters via the log. So the higher the SUSE mass, the larger the log, and so the larger the one loop correction here. So this is one place where it enters, so the SUSE mass scale enters logarithmically. Another detail? Yeah, I mean, uh, you are right that uh, the matching should really be done for all parameters, including vacuum and also Yukawa and so on, but for all the other parameters at this lowest order matching, nothing much happens. But I want to highlight once again this term, which comes from the three level matching of lambda. We discussed it before, but it's still there. And so the SUSE details enter in exactly these two places, namely here. That is a prediction of the SUSE spectrum a SUSE detail and uh, that. These are the precise two places where it matters. And by the way, in different SUSE models, which are not the MSSM, but some other models like the NMSSM, this changes. Right. This changes and uh, here, but this will not change in different SUSE models because that comes from the standard model beta functions. Here only the value of the log will change. Let us now do uh, non-logarithmic improvements. So we do step one and step three at the one loop order. And let us uh, simply uh, say from experience, which you might not have, but let me tell you that the most important contributions are the ones which are proportional to xt times the top Yukawa coupling. Um, and let us, for simplicity, ignore all loop diagrams which are not proportional to xt and yt. Then, because that can be large, and so that would be an enhancement. So that rules out in particular immediately step three. Step three was calculate the Higgs mass in the standard model at the low scale. So that is a pure standard model calculation. This doesn't depend on XT. Therefore, uh, step three can still be done at three level if we use the approximation that only loop diagrams with XT are important, then uh, three is still three level. As before, so the Higgs mass is still simply given by lambda times v square without any modification. But what we need to figure out is how does the matching for lambda change? So what we need to do is now step one at the one loop level, proportional to xt times yt diagrams. And so what we need to do is to do the following. We now need to do a matching calculation. So in the standard model, we have one diagram with the quartic Higgs coupling, 
which is given by the Feynman rule lambda, lambda hat. And that should be equal to the diagrams in the MSSM. And in the MSSM, we have now the following. We have, on the one hand, the three-level diagram, where here there is the coupling g square plus g square w and y divided by 4. So that at three level, we get the equation lambda hat should be equal to this gauge coupling combination. But now we have also one loop diagrams in the MSSM, namely the ones which use this xt vertex. And there is, first of all, the following Feynman diagram. namely a Feynman diagram with four external Higgs bosons and a loop which consists of four vertices of this trilinear form, one Higgs boson and two stops. So here we have a loop in which they propagate four stop particles and at each vertex we have this xt times yt. Right? So this Feynman diagram will be proportional to xt to the fourth power times yt to the fourth power. There are also other diagrams which look like the following. So here we have two trilinear vertices namely one Higgs couples to two stops here and here. And then we have a quartic vertex where two stops couple to two Higgs bosons. And here without uh, discussing more details, this vertex um, is the Susi counterpart to the Yukawa coupling of the Higgs to the top quark. So this vertex or two vertices of that kind is proportional to Yukawa square. And these two vertices are each time xt times Yukawa. So overall, we get xt square times, again, Yukawa to the fourth power. So two powers of Yukawa, two powers of the Yukawa, Yukawa to the fourth, but only two powers of xt. And there are different permutations of these diagrams, which leads to symmetry factors and so on, which would need to be calculated. But let us not do the calculation. This is only for you to understand which kind of diagrams exist. And this allows you to understand the structure of the formulas in the result. And uh, I already gave you a nice reference, which is a review by Draper and Shehak who uh, very pedagogically reviewed such calculations. And uh, in their chapter 4.3, they uh, describe exactly and very nicely this matching calculation, basically in the same language that we use here. And the result is that uh, lambda hat at the SUSI scale after the matching is now approximately um, given by a gauge coupling square over four, that was the three level result, and now there is a one loop correction from these diagrams, and the correction is six times kappa L times y top to the fourth power times xt square times one minus xt square divided by 12. That is the result. And so here again, kappa L is 1 over 16 pi square, so this uh, signifies a one-loop correction. And so you have a nice one-line formula for three-level plus one-loop matching for lambda. And you see again that lambda in the standard model is predicted in terms of SUSI parameters. And now it's not only gauge couplings, which we have already measured, but now additional SUSI parameters that are just depending on the details of how SUSI is realized in nature they enter. And so this is now a dependence on SUSI details, which we don't know, and the resulting prediction for the Higgs mass will therefore depend on xt. So just as a remark, this is the matching for lambda, and we should do a similar matching, like you have mentioned, for all the parameters, gauge coupling matching, Yukawa coupling matching, and so on. 
But in all the other cases, uh, nothing important for us happens, but one should, of course, go through the details. So one should do similar matching for G, W, and Y hat in terms of uh, the SUSY parameters and Y, T hat, and maybe for further parameters. But uh, let me just tell you, this is unimportant here. So it does not produce uh, effects that we have uh, would have to take into account. All right, so let me summarize the result from this. So one loop matching plus one loop running gives the following prediction for the Higgs mass. Namely, m Higgs square is equal to the z mass square as before. And now we get uh, additive corrections. One additive correction here from the running and an additional additive correction from the additional matching at the high scale. And let me combine it by factoring out this uh, factor with a vacuum. So plus six times v square times y top hat to the fourth power at mt times kappa l times a bracket. In the bracket we have first of all two times the logarithm of m susi over mt. So you know here we had 12 but now we have 6 times 2 times the log plus the correction from the matching we have factored out this prefactor, so we get now plus xt squared times 1 minus xt squared divided by 12 plus higher orders. So, and uh, let me now comment. So this result contains on the one hand all logs of the form n loop times log to the n, in particular one loop times single log. But in addition, it now contains a non-logarithmic one-loop term from the uh, matching at the high scale. So combining the two, we essentially have the full one-loop prediction of the SUSY theory. We have only neglected one thing, namely power suppressed terms. We have only neglected terms which are suppressed by 1 over m SUSY square because we do matching to a dimension, uh, to a renormalizable <coughs> theory and neglect non-renormalizable operators. So we have neglected power suppressed terms, but otherwise this represents the full one loop correction. Full in the sense that we have only looked at XT terms. Okay, that means full for us in a, in a way. So this is the full, and you, if you do not do this restriction here, then you would get here really the full one loop correction up to power suppressed terms. So that corresponds to the full one loop prediction. Um, from yt and xt plus um, up to um, order m top divided by m susi, which are systematically neglected. But we do not only have one loop, we have also two loop log square terms, three loop log cube terms, and so on. So all of this is included correctly in this formula. So we do not have so much time, but let me just say to connect to the last lecture. Generally, we argued that one should do the following one should do L loop matching and L plus one loop running because that consistently resums all logs and subleading logs of a particular order. And so in this case, if we do one loop matching, two loop running, 
and then again one loop computation of the Higgs mass in the standard model. Then we get a prediction which would contain full one loop and a two loop um, all locks, three loop leading and subleading lock and so on. So we get consistently one loop result complete and all the logarithms which depend on the full one loop result are also correctly obtained. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think uh, we should stop here. I mean, I had prepared some slides of some current status. Um, I don't know uh, whether we have time, whether somebody else wants into the room or you need to go, but otherwise I could show you the current status. But in words, the current status is that uh, one has done the matching up to three loop order, running up to four loop order, and this calculation also up to three loop order, according to the largest important effects. So one does always approximations similar to this one, where one isolates um, the most important kinds of one loop enhancements, instead of blindly computing everything. But with this in mind, three loop plus four loop plus three loop is available, and that gives a prediction of the Higgs mass with a theory uncertainty of plus minus one GeV. So with this incredible effort, you have just one GeV uncertainty, which is a 1% accuracy. Incredibly, um, let's say, large theory uncertainty compared to the effort that goes into it. And so um, after the Higgs discovery at the LHC, or at the Higgs discovery at the LHC, the status was two loop predictions partially three loop, but without this uh, setup with renormalization group improvement. And then, first of all, it turned out that SUSY particles are probably heavy, such that we have these large logarithms in the calculation everywhere. And it was uh, becoming important to resum the logs. Therefore, fixed order calculations in the full theory were clearly inappropriate, and I could show you plots how inappropriate the fixed one loop or even fixed three loop calculations are, they are totally off of the true result. You need to do this RGE running in order to take into account higher order logarithms. And then there was an effort in the last 10 years to significantly improve the calculations, uh, mainly using the setup of EFT plus the renormalization group equation and the current status is this one, which is about um, satisfactory, I would say. And so at this point, we can probably stop um, a lot of further improvements at even higher orders, because uh, this is now sufficient, even though the experimental accuracy is still 10 times better than the theory accuracy, because the Higgs mass is known to 0.1 GeV accuracy. And as I said, the theory uh, uncertainty is of the order of one GeV, depending on the details and how you estimate the theory uncertainty. So, but that is uh, also for our group, one of the important applications of this method. And so here we can stop, and then in the next lecture, we will begin with probably the final um, task for our semester, namely to look at uh, EFTs and renormalization group in the context of non-renormalizable operators where we have dimension five, dimension six operators, uh, which is a hot topic also in current particle physics and I will explain you how that works. Okay, so see you next week.